The flat earth theory was discovered by Samuel Barley Rothelham in the 1800s. He was an English inventor and writer who wrote Scientific Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, Under the Parallax. His work was based on his decade-long studies of the Earth and was originally published as a 16-page pamphlet in 1849, which he later expanded into a 430-page book in 1881. According to Samuel, the Earth is an enclosed plane centered at the North Pole and bounded along its outward edge by a wall of ice with the sun, moon, planets, and stars only a few hundred miles above the surface of the earth. We are living under a shield glass dome. was discovered in the 1800s. This has been an ongoing topic for decades now. And also Samuel was accomplished for debater who re repeatedly steamrolled all opponents and his followers who included many well-educated people. One of them was John Hampton. He got involved in a bed with the famous naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, about the flat earth. Later on, they did an experiment, which Hampton proposed didn't resolve the issue, and the two ended up in court in 1871. The judge ruled against Hampton, who started a long campaign of legal harassment of Wallace. Rothingham, which is Samuel, hints at the incident in this book that he made. Entered at Stationer's Hall. Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe. An experimental inquiry into the true figure of the Earth, proving it a plane, without axial or orbital motion, and the only material world in the universe by Parallax London Simpkin Marshall and Co Stationers Hall Court Bath Hayward Green Street 1865 the right of translation is reserved by the author Bath printed at South Hayward Green Street general contents section 1 introduction experiments proving the earth to be a plane Section 2, the Earth, no axial or orbital motion. Section 3, the true distance of the sun and stars. Section 4, the sun moves in a circle over the Earth, concentric with the North Pole. Section 5, diameter of the sun's path constantly changing. Section 6, cause of day and night, seasons, etc. Section 7, cause of sunrise and sunset. Section 8, cause of sun appearing larger when arising and setting and when in meridian section 9 cause of solar lunar eclipses section 10 cause of the tides section 11 constitution condition and ultimate destruction of the earth by fire section 12 miscellaneous moon's phases moon's appearance planet Neptune Pendulum experiments as proof of Earth's motion. Section 13, perspective on the sea. Section 14, general summary, application, Cubono. Zetetic astronomy. The term zetetic is derived from the Greek verb zeteo, which means to search or examine, to proceed only by inquiry. None can doubt that by making special experiments and collecting manifest and undeniable facts, arranging them in logical order and observing what is naturally and fairly deducible, 
the result will be far more consistent and satisfactory than by framing a theory or system and assuming the existence of causes for which there is no direct evidence and which only can be admitted for the sake of argument. All theories are of this character. Supposing instead of inquiring, imagining systems instead of learning from observation and experience the true constitution of things, speculative men by the force of genius may invent systems that will perhaps be greatly admired for a time. These, however, are phantoms which the force of truth will sooner or later dispel. And while we are pleased with the deceit, true philosophy, with all the arts and improvements that depend upon it, suffers. The real state of things escapes our observation, or if it presents itself to us, we are apt either to reject it, wholly as fiction, or by new efforts of vain, ingenuity to interweave it with our own conceits, and labor to make it tally with our favorite schemes. Thus, by blending together all parts so ill-suited, the whole becomes forth an absurd composition of truth and error. These have not done near so much harm as that pride and ambition which has led philosophers to think it beneath them to offer anything less to the world than a complete and finished system of nature. And, in order to obtain this at once, to take the liberty of inventing certain principles and hypotheses, from which they pretend to explain all her mysteries. Copernicus admitted, it's not necessary that hypothesis should be true or even probable. It is sufficient that they lead to results of calculation which agree with calculations. Neither let anyone, so far as hypotheses are concerned, expect anything certain from astronomy, since that science can afford nothing of the kind lest in case he should adopt for truth things find for another purpose. He should leave this study more foolish than he came. The hypothesis of the terrestrial motion was nothing but an hypothesis, valuable only so far as it explained phenomena, and not considered with reference to absolute truth or falsehood. An account of Sir Isaac Newton's discoveries by Professor McLaurin. M.A. F.R.S. of the Chair, Mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. Newtonian and all other systems of nature are little better than the hypothesis of the terrestrial motion of Copernicus. These foundations or premises are always unproved. No proof is ever attempted. The necessity for it is denied. It is considered sufficient that the assumptions shall seem to explain the phenomena selected. In this way, it is that one theory supplants another. That system gives way to system as one failure after another compels opinions to change. This will ever be so. There will always exist in the mind a degree of uncertainty, a disposition to look upon philosophy as a vain pretension, a something almost antagonistic to the highest aspirations in which humanity can indulge, unless the practice of theorizing be given up, and the method of simple inquiry, the zetetic process, be adopted. Nature speaks to us in peculiar, peculiar language. In the language of phenomena, she answers at all times the questions which are put to her, and such questions are experiments not experiments only which corroborate what has previously been assumed to be true, but experiments in every form bearing on the subject of inquiry, before a conclusion is drawn or premise is affirmed. We have an excellent example of zetetic reasoning in a, in a arithmetical operation, more especially so in what is called the golden rule, or the rule of three. If one hundred weight of any article is worth a given sum, what will some other weight of that article be worth? The separate figures may be considered as the elements or facts of the inquiry. The placing and working of these as the logical arrangement and the quotient or answer is the fair and natural deduction. Hence, in every zetetic process, the conclusion has arrived at is essentially a quotient, which, if the details be correct, must be of necessity be true beyond the reach or power of contradiction.
in our efforts of justice. We have also an example of the zetetic process. A prisoner is placed at the bar. Evidence for and against him is advanced. It is carefully arranged and patently considered, and only such a verdict given us could not in justice be avoided. Society would not tolerate any other procedure. It would brand with infamy whomever should assume a prisoner to be guilty and prohibit all evidence, but such as would corroborate the assumption. Yet such is the character of theoretical philosophy. The zetetic process is also the natural method of investigation. Nature herself teaches it. Children invariably seek information by asking questions, by earnestly inquiring from those around them. Question after question in rapid and exciting succession will often proceed from a child until the most profound in learning philosophy will feel puzzled to reply. If both nature and justice, as well as the common sense and practical experience of mankind demand, and will not be content with less or other than the zetetic process, why should it be ignored and violated by the learned in philosophy? Let the practice of theorizing be cast aside as one fatal to the full development of truth, oppressive to the reasoning power, and in every sense inimical to the progress and permanent improvement of the human race. If then we adopt the zetetic process to ascertain the true figure and condition of the earth, we shall find that instead of its being a globe and moving in space, it is the direct contrary, a plane without motion and unaccompanied by anything in the firmament analogous to itself. If the earth is a globe and 25,000 miles in circumference, the surface of all standing water must have a certain degree of convexivity. Every part must be an arc of a circle, curvating from the summit at the rate of 8 inches per mile multiplied by the square of the distance. That this may be sufficiently understood, the following quotation is given from the Encyclopedia. Britannica art, quote, leveling, quote, if a line which crosses the plumb line at right angles be continued for any considerable length, it will rise above the Earth's surface, the Earth being globular in this hypothesis, and this rising will be as the square of the distance to which the said right line is produced. So, that is to say, it's raised eight inches very nearly above the Earth's surface at one mile distance, four times as much, or 32 inches, at the distance of two miles, nine times as much, or 72 inches, at the distance of three miles. This is owing to the globular figure of the Earth, and this raising is the difference between the true and apparent levels, the curve of the Earth being the true level, and the tangent to it the apparent level. So soon does the difference between the true and apparent levels become perceptible that it is unnecessary to make an allowance for it if the distance betwixt the two stations exceeds two chains. Picture one. Let B, D be a small portion of the Earth's circumference whose center of curvature is A and consequently all the points of this arc will be on a level. But a tangent BC meeting the vertical line A, D, and C will be the apparent level at the point B and therefore DC is the difference between the apparent and the true level at point B. The distance CD must be deducted from the observed height to have the true difference of level or the differences between the distances of two points from the surface of the earth or from the center of curvature. But we shall afterwards see how this correction may be avoided altogether in certain cases. To find an expression for CD, we have Euclid, third book, 36, prop, which proves that the BC squared equals CD, 2AD times CD. But since in all cases of leveling, CD is exceedingly small compared with 2AD, we may safely neglect CD and then BC equals 2AD times CD or CD equals BC 
squared over 9 AD. Hence, the depression of the true level is equal to the square of the distance divided by twice the radius of the curvature of the Earth. For example, taking a distance of 4 miles, the square of 4 equals 16, and putting down twice the radius of the Earth's curvature, as in round figures about 8,000 miles, we make the depression on 4 miles equals 16 over 8,000, of a mile equals 16 times 1760 over 8,000, in yards equals 160, 176 over 50, yards equals 528 over 50, feet, or rather better than 10 and a half feet. Or if we take the mean radius of the Earth as the mean radius of its curvature, and consequently 2 AD equals 7912 miles, then 5280 feet being one mile, we shall have the CD in the depression in inches, 5280 times 12 times BC squared over 7912 equals 8008 BC squared inches. The preceding remarks suppose the visual ray CB to be a straight line, whereas on account of the unequal densities of the air at different di distances from the Earth, the rays of light are incurvated by refraction. The effect of this is to lessen the difference between the true and apparent levels, but in such an extremely variable and uncertain manner that if any constant or fixed allowance is made for it in formula or tables, it will often lead to a greater error than what was intended to obviate. For though the refraction may at a mean compensate for about a seventh of the curvature of the Earth, it sometimes exceeds a fifth, and at other times does not amount to a fifteenth. We have therefore made no allowance for refraction of the foregone formula. If the Earth is a globe, there cannot be a question that, however irregular, the land may be in form, the water must have a convex surface. And as the difference between the true and apparent level or the degree of curvature would be eight inches in one mile, and in every succeeding mile eight inches multiplied by the square of the distance, there can be no difficulty in detecting either its actual existence or proportion. Experiments made up on the sea have been objected to on account of its constantly changing altitude, and the existence of banks and channels which produce a crowding of the waters, currents, and other irregularities. Standing water has therefore been selected, and many important experiments have been made, the most simple of which is the following. In the county of Cambridge, there is an artificial river or canal called the Old Bedford. It is upwards of 20 miles long and passes straight in a straight line through that part of the fens called the Bedford Level. The water is nearly stationary, often entirely so, and throughout its entire length has no interruption from locks or water gates, so that it is, in every respect, well adapted for ascertaining whether any and what amount of convexivity really exists. A boat with a flag standing three feet above the water was directed to sail from a place called Wellney Bridge to another place called Welch's Dam. These two points are six statute miles apart. The observer, with a good telescope, was seated in the water as a bather, it being the summer season, with the eye not exceeding eight inches above the surface. The flag and the boat down to the water's edge were clearly visible throughout the whole distance. From this observation, it was concluded that the water did not decline to any degree from the line of sight, whereas the water would be six feet higher in the center of the arc of six miles extent than at the two places, Welney Bridge and Welch's Dam, but as the eye of the observer was only eight inches above the water, the highest point on the surface would be at one mile from the place of observation, below which point the surface of the water at the end of the remaining five miles would be 16 feet 8 inches, or 5 squared times 8 equals 200 inches. This will be rendered clear by the following diagram. Let AB represent the arc of water from Welney Bridge to Welch's Dam, six miles in length, and AL the line of sight, which is now a tangent to the arc, AB. The point of contact, T, is one mile from the eye of the observer at A, and from T to the boat at B is five miles. 
The square of 5 miles multiplied by 8 inches is 200 inches, or in other words, that the boat at B would have been 200 inches or above 16 feet below the surface of the water at T. And the flag on the boat, which was 3 feet high, would have been 13 feet below the line of sight at ATL. From this experiment, it follows that the surface of standing water is not convex, and therefore that the earth is not a globe. On the contrary, this simple experiment is all sufficient to prove that the surface of the water is parallel to the line of sight and is therefore horizontal, and that the earth cannot be other than a plane. In diagram figure 3, this is perfectly illustrated. Picture 3. AB is the line of sight and CD the surface of the water equidistant from or parallel to it throughout the whole distance observed. Although, on account of the variable state of the water, objections have been raised to experiments made upon the seashore to test the convexivity of the flood or ebb tide level, none can be urged against observations made from higher altitudes. For example, the distance across the Irish Sea between Douglas Harbour in the Isle of Man and the Great Orm's Head in North Wales is 60 miles. If the earth is a globe and the surface of the water would form an arc, 60 miles in length, the center of which would be 1,944 feet higher than the coastline at either end, so that an observer would be obliged to attain this altitude before he could see the Welsh coast from the Isle of Man, as shown in the diagram figure 4. It is well known, however, that from an altitude not exceeding 100 feet, that the Great Orm's Head is visible in clear weather from Douglas Harbor. The altitude of 100 feet could cause the line of sight to touch the horizon at the distance of nearly 13 miles, and from the horizon to Orm's Head being 47 miles, the square of this number multiplied by 8 inches gives 1,472 feet as the distance which the Welsh coastline would need to be below the line of sight, BC, A representing the Great Orm's Head, which is being 600 feet high in its summit, would be 872 feet below the horizon. Many similar experiments have been made across the St. George's Canal between points near Dublin and Hollyhead, and always with results entirely incompatible with the doctrine of rotundity. Again, it is known that the horizon at sea, whatever distance it may extend to the right and left of the observer on land, always appears as a straight line. The following experiment has been tried in various parts of the country at Brighton on a rising ground near the race course. Two poles were fixed in the earth, six yards apart, and directly opposite the sea. Between these poles, a line was tightly stretched parallel to the distant horizon. From center of the line, the view embraced not less than 20 miles on each side, making a distance of 40 miles. A vessel was observed sailing directly westwards. The line cut the rigging a little above the bulkwards, which it did, did for several hours, or until the vessel had sailed at the whole distance of 40 miles. This will be understood by reference to the diagram figure 5. If the earth were a globe, the appearance would be as represented in figure 6. The ship coming into view from the east would have to ascend an inclined plane for 20 miles until it arrived at the center of an arc AB, whence it would have to descend for the same distance. The square of 20 miles multiplied by 8 inches gives 266 feet as the amount the vessel would be below the line CD at the beginning and at the end of the 40 miles. If we stand upon the deck of a ship or mount to the mast ahead or go to the top of a mountain or ascend above the earth in a balloon and look over the sea, the surface appears as a vast inclined plane raising up in the distance, it intercepts the line of sight. If a good mirror can be held in the opposite direction, the horizon will be reflected as a well-defined mark or line across the center as represented in the diagram figure 7. Ascending or descending, the distant horizon does the same. It rises and falls with the observer and is always on a level with 
his eye. If he takes a position where the water surrounds him as at the masthead of a ship out of sight of land or on the summit of a small island far from the mainland, the surface of the sea appears to rise up on all sides equally and to surround him like the walls of an immense amphitheater. He seems to be in the center of a large concavity, the edges of which expand or contract as he takes a higher or lower position. This appearance is so well known to seagoing travelers that nothing more need be said in its support. But the appearance from a balloon is familiar only to a small number of observers, and therefore it will be useful to quote from those who have written upon the subject. The apparent, quote, Wise's Aeronautics, quote, The apparent concavity of the earth as seen from a balloon, a perfectly formed circle encompassed by the visible planisphere beneath, or rather the concave osphere, it might be called, for I had attained a height from which the surface of the earth assumed a regularly hollowed or concave appearance, an optical illusion which increases as you recede from it. At the greatest elevation I ever attained, which was about a mile and a half, the appearance of the world around me assumed a shape or form like that which is made by placing two watch glasses together by their edges, the balloon apparently in the central cavity all the time of its flight at the elevation. End quote. Wise's Aeronautics. Great World of London. Quote, Another curious effect of the serial ascent was that the earth, when we were at our greatest altitude, positively appeared concave, looking like a huge dark bowl, rather than the convex sphere such as we naturally expect to see. The horizon always appeared to be on a level with our eye, and seems to rise as we rise, until at length of the elevation of the circular boundary line of sight becomes so marked that the earth assumes the anomalous appearance, as we have said, of a concave rather than a convex body. Mayhew's Great World of London, end quote. Mr. Elliot, an American aeronaut, in a letter giving an account of his ascension from Baltimore, thus speaks of the appearance of the earth from a balloon. Quote, I don't know that I ever hinted heretofore that the aeronaut may well be most skeptical man about the rotundity of the earth. Philosophy imposes the truth upon us, but the view of the earth from the elevation of a balloon is that of an immense terrestrial basin, the deeper part of which is that directly under one's feet. As we ascend, the earth be beneath us seems to recede actually to sink away while the horizon gradually and gracefully lifts a diversified slope stretching away further and further to a line that at the highest elevation seems to close with the sky. Thus upon a clear day the aeronaut feels as if suspended at about an equal distance between the vast blue oceanic concave above and the equally expanded terrestrial basin below. The chief peculiarity of the view from a balloon at a considerable elevation was the altitude of the horizon, which remained practically on level with the eye at elevations of two miles, causing the surface of the earth to appear concave instead of convex, and to recede during the rapid ascent, whilst the horizon and the balloon seemed to be stationary. End quote. London Journal, July 18, 1857. During the important balloon ascents recently made for scientific purposes by Mr. Croxwell and Mr. Glacier of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, the same phenomenon was observed. The horizon always appeared on level with the car. Vide, Gallisher's report. The following diagram represents this appearance. Figure 8. The surface of the Earth, CD, appears to rise to the line of sight from the balloon and seems to close with the sky. At the points HH, in the same manner that the ceiling and the floor of a long room or the top and bottom of a tunnel appear to approach each other, and from the same cause, visually, 
that they are parallel to the line of sight and therefore horizontal. If the Earth's surface were convex, the observer looking from a balloon instead of seeing it gradually ascend to the level of the eye would have, a, have to look downwards to the horizon, HH represented in figure 10, and the amount of dip in the line of sight, CH, would be the greatest at the highest elevation. Many more experiments have been made that are here described, but the selection now given is amply sufficient to prove that the surface of water is horizontal and that the Earth, taken as a whole, its land and water together, is not a globe, has really no degree of sphericity, but is to all intents and purposes a plane. If we now consider the fact that when we travel by land or sea, and from any part of the known world in a direction towards the North Polar Star, we shall arrive at what in the same point. We are forced to the conclusion that what has hitherto been called the North Polar Region is really the center of the Earth. That from its northern center, the land diverges and stretches out of necessity towards a circumference, which must now be called the Southern Region, which is a vast circle and not a pole or center, that there is one center, the north, and one circumference, the south, this language will be better understood by reference to the diagram in figure 10. Figure 10. North represents the northern center and SSS the southern circumference both icy or frozen regions, that the south is an immense ring or glacial boundary is evident from the fact that within the Antarctic Circle, the most experienced scientific and daring navigators have failed in their attempts to sail in a direct manner completely around it. Lieutenant Wilkes of the American Navy, after great and prolonged efforts and much confusion in his reckoning, and seeing no prospect of success, was obliged to give up his attempt and return to the north. This he acknowledged in a letter to Captain Sir James Clark Ross, with whose intention to explore the South Seas he had become acquainted, in which the following words occur, quote, I hope you intend to circumnavigate the Antarctic Circle. I made 70 degrees of it, end quote. Captain Ross, however, was himself greatly confused in his attempts to navigate the southern region. In his account of the voyage, he says at page 96, quote, We found ourselves every day from 12 to 6 miles by observation and advance of our reckoning, end quote. Quote, by our observations we found ourselves 58 miles to the eastward of our reckoning in two days, end quote. And in this and other ways, all the great navigators have been frustrated in their efforts and have been more or less confounded in their attempts to sail around the Earth upon or beyond the Antarctic Circle. But if the southern region is a pole or center like the north, there would be little difficulty in circumnavigating it, for the distance round would be comparatively small. When it is seen that the Earth is not a sphere, but a plane having only one center, the North, and that the South is the vast icy boundary of the world, the difficulties experienced by circumnavigators can be easily understood. Having given a surface or bird's eye view of the Earth, the following sectional representation will aid in completing the description. That's figure 11. EE represents the earth, WW the great deep, or the waters which surround the land, and N the northern center, and SS sections of the southern ice. At the present description is purely zetetic, and is every fact must therefore have its fullest value assigned to it, and its consequences represented. A peculiarity must be pointed out in the foregoing diagram. It will be observed that from about points EE, -E, the surface of the water rises towards the south, SS. It's clearly ascertained that the altitude of the water in various parts of the world is much influenced by the pressure of the atmosphere. However, this pressure is caused, and it is well known that the atmosphere pressure in the south is constantly less than it is in the north. 
and therefore the water in the southern region must always be considerably higher than it is in the northern. Hence the peculiarity referred to in the diagram, the following quotation from Sir James Ross's Voyages, page 483, will corroborate the above statements. Quote, Our barometrical experiments appear to prove that a gradual diminution of atmospheric pressure occurs as we proceed southwards from the Tropic of Capricorn. It has hitherto been considered that the mean pressure of the atmosphere at the level of the sea was nearly the same in all parts of the world, as no material difference occurs between the equator and the highest northern latitudes. The causes of the atmospheric pressure being so very much less in the southern than in the northern hemispheres remains to be determined. Thus, putting all theories aside, we have seen that direct experiment demonstrates the important truth that the earth is an extended plane, literally stretched out upon the waters, founded on the seas and established on the floods, standing in the water and out of the water, how far the southern icy region extends horizontally, or how deep the waters upon and in which the earth stands, or is supported, are questions which cannot yet be answered. And I'll note, even in 2015, there are places of the oceans we've never mapped the floors. In Zetetic philosophy, the foundation must be well secured, progress must be made step by step, making good the ground as we proceed. And whenever a difficulty presents itself or evidence fails to carry us farther, we must promptly and candidly acknowledge it and prepare for future investigation, but never fill up the inquiry by theory and assumption. In the present instance, there is no practical evidence as to the extent of the southern ice and the, quote, great deep. Who shall say whether the depth and extent of the mighty waters have a limit or constitute the world without an end? Having advanced direct and special evidence that the surface of the earth is not convex, but on the contrary, a vast and irregular plane, it now becomes important that the leading phenomena upon which the doctrine of rotundity has been founded should be carefully examined. First, it is contended that because of the hull of an outward-bound vessel disappears before the masthead, the water must be convex, and therefore the earth is a globe. In this conclusion, however, there is an assumption involved, visual, that such a phenomenon can only result from a convex surface. Inquiry will show that this is erroneous. If we select for observation a few miles of straight and level railway, we shall find that the rails, which are parallel, appear in the distance to approach each other. But the two rails, which are nearest together, do so more rapidly than those which are furthest asunder as shown in the following diagram, figure 12. Figures 12 and 13. Let the observer stand at the point A, looking in the direction of the arrows, and the rails 1, 2, 3, 4 will appear to join at the point B. But the rail 5, 6 will appear to have converged only as far as C towards B. Again, let a train be watched from the point A on figure 13. The observer looking from A, with his eye midway between the bottom of the carriage and the rail, will see the diameter of the wheels gradually diminish as they recede. The lines 1, 2, and 1, 4 will appear to approach each other until at the point B they will come together. And the space, including the wheels between the bottom of the carriage and the rail, will there disappear. The floor of the carriage will seem to be sliding without wheels upon the rail, 1, 2, but the lines 5, 6, and 7, 8 will yet have converged only to C and D. The same phenomenon may be observed with the long row of lamps, where the ground is a straight line throughout its entire length as represented in figure 14. Figures 14 and 15, the lines 1, 2, and A, D will converge at the point D and the pedestal of the lamp at D will seem to have disappeared, but the line 3, 4, which represents the true altitude of the lamps, will only have converged to the point C. A narrow bank running along the side of a straight portion of railway upon which poles are placed for supporting the wires of the electric telegraph will produce the same appearance as shown in figure 15. Talking about telephone poles. 
the bank having the altitude 1.13 and 1.24 will, in the distance of two or three miles, according to its depth, disappear to the eye of an observer placed at figure one. And the telegraph pole at figure two will seem not to stand upon a bank at all, but upon the actual railway. The line 3-4 will merge into the line 1-2 at the point B, while the line 5-6 will only have descended to the position C. Many other familiar instances could be given to show the true law of perspective, which is that parallel lines appear in the distance to converge to one and the same datum line, but to reach it at different distances if themselves dissimilarly distant. This law being remembered, it's easy to understand how the hull of an outward bound ship, although sailing upon a plane, surface disappears before the masthead. On figure 16, let AB represent the surface of the water, CH the line of sight, and ED the altitude of the masthead. Then, as AB and CH are nearer to each other than AB and ED, they will converge and appear to meet at the point. Figure 16, H, which is the practical, or as it would be better to call the optical horizon, the hull of the vessel being contained within the lines of AB and CH, must gradually diminish as these converge until at H, or the horizon, it enters the vanishing point and disappears. But the masthead represented by the line ED is still above the horizon at H and will require to sail more or less according to its altitude beyond the point H before it sinks into the line CH, or in other words, before the lines AB and ED form the same angles as AB and CH. It will be evident that it also that should the elevation of the observer be greater than C, the horizon or vanishing point would not be formed at H, but at a greater distance, and therefore the hull of the vessel would be longer visible. Or, if when the hull has disappeared at H, the observer ascends from the elevation at C to a higher position nearer to E, it will again be seen. Thus, all the phenomenon which have so long been considered as proofs of the Earth's rotundity are really optical sequences of the contrary doctrine to argue that because the lower part of an outward bound ship disappears before the highest, the water must be round is to assume that a round surface only can produce this effect exclamation point but it is now shown that a plane surface necessarily produces this effect and therefore the assumption is not required and the argument involved is fallacious exclamation point it may here be observed that no help can be given to this doctrine of rotundity by quoting the prevailing theory of perspective the law represented in the foregoing diagrams is the law of nature. It may be seen in every layer of a long wall, in every hedge and bank of the roadside, and indeed in every direction where lines and objects run parallel to each other. But no illustration of the contrary perspective is ever to be seen, except in the distorted pictures otherwise cleverly and beautifully drawn as they are, which abound in our public and private collections. I should mention that even in 2015, such things have gotten much, much worse than they were back in the late 1800s. The theory which affirms that parallel lines converge only to one and the same point upon the eye line is an error. It is true only of lines equidistant from the eye line. It is true that parallel lines converge to one and the same eye line, but meet it at different distances when more or less apart from one another. This is the true law of perspective as shown by nature herself. Any other idea is fallacious and will deceive whoever may hold and apply it to practice. As it is of great importance that the difference should be clearly understood, the following diagram is given. Let EL in figure 17 represent the eye line and C the vanishing point of the lines 1, C, 2, C and the lines 3, 4, 5, 6 
although converging somewhere to the line EL will not do so to the point C but 3 4 and will proceed to D and 5 and 6 to H it is repeated that lines equidistant from the datum will converge on the same point and at the same distance but lines not equidistant will converge on the same datum but at different distances a very good illustration of the difference is given in figure 18 theoretic perspective would bring the lines 1 2 and 3 to the same datum line EL and to the same point A but the true or natural law would bring the lines 2 and 3 to the point A because equidistant from the I line EL but the line 1 being further from EL than either 2 or 3 would be taken beyond the point A on towards C until it formed the same angle upon the line EL as 2 and 3 form at the point A. The subject of perspective will not be rendered sufficiently clear unless an explanation be given of the cause and character of what is technically called the quote vanishing point. Why do objects even when raised above the earth vanish at a great distance? It is known and can only be easily proved by experiment that the quote range of the eye or diameter of the field of vision is 110 degrees. Consequently, this is the largest angle under which an object can be seen. The range of vision is from 110 degrees to 1 degree. The smallest angle under which an object can be seen is upon an average for different sites, the 60th part of a degree or one minute in space so that when an object is removed from the eye 3,000 times its own diameter it will only just be distinguishable consequently the greatest distance at which we can behold an object like a shilling of an inch in di diameter <laughs> is 3,000 inches or 250 feet it may therefore be very easily understood that a line passing over the hull of a ship and continuing parallel to the surface of the water must converge to the vanishing point at the distance of about 3,000 times its own elevation. In other words, if the surface of the hull be 10 feet above the water, it will vanish at 3,000 times 10 feet or nearly six statute miles but if the masthead be 30 feet above the water it will be visible for 90,000 feet or over 17 miles so that it could be seen upon the horizon for a distance of 11 miles after the hole had entered the vanishing point hence the phenomenon of a receding ship's hull being the first to disappear which has been so universally quoted and relied upon as proving the rotundity of the earth is fairly and logically a proof of the very contrary it has been misapplied in consequences of an erroneous view of the law of perspective and the desire to support a theory that is its valueless for such a purpose has already been shown and that even if there were no question of the earth's form involved it could not arise from the concavity of the water is proved by the following experiment let an observer stand upon the seashore with the eye at an elevation of about six feet above the water and watch a vessel until it is just hull down if now a good telescope be applied to the hull will be distinctly restored to sight from which it must be concluded that had it disappeared through the influence of perspective and not from having sunk behind the summit of a convex surface had it done so it would follow that telescope had either carried the line of sight through the mass of water or over its surface and down the other side but the power of looking round a corner or penetrating a dense and extensive medium has never yet been attributed to such an instrument if the elevation of the observer be much greater than six feet 
the distance at which the vanishing point is formed will be so great that the telescope may not have power enough to magnify or enlarge the angle constituting it when the experiment would appear to fail but the failure would only be apparent for a telescope of sufficient power to magnify at the horizon or vanishing point would certainly restore the hole at the greater distance an illustration or proof of the earth's rotundity is also supposed to be found in the fact that navigators by sailing due east or west return in the opposite direction here again a supposition is involved visual that upon a globe only could this occur but it is easy to prove that it could take place as perfectly upon a circular plane as upon a sphere let it first be clearly understood what is really meant by sailing due east and west. Practically, it is sailing at right angles to north and south. This is determined ordinarily by the mariner's compass, but more accurately by the meridian lines which converge to the northern center of the earth. Bearing this in mind, let north in figure 19 represent the northern center. So figure 19 represents the northern center, and the lines NS, the directions north and south. Then let the small arrow, figure 1, represent the vessel on the meridian of Greenwich, with its head, W, at right angles or due west, and the stern, E, due east. It is evident that in passing to the position of the arrow, figure 2, which is still due west or square to the meridian, the arc, one two must be described and in sailing still further under the same condition the arcs two three three four and four one will be successive successfully passed over until the meridian of greenwich figure one is arrived at which was the point of departure thus a mariner by keeping the head of his vessel due west or at right angles to the north and south practically circumnavigates a plane surface or, in other words, he describes a circle upon a plane, at a greater or lesser distance from the center north, and being at all times square to the radii north and south, he is compelled to do so, because the earth is a plane, having a central region towards which the compass and the meridian lines which guide him converge. So far, then, from the fact of a vessel sailing due west, coming home from the east, and vice versa, being a proof of the earth's rotundity, is simply a phenomenon consistent with and dependent upon its being a plane. The subject may be perfectly illustrated by the following simple experiment. Take a round table, fix a pin in the center, to this attach a thread, and extend it to the edge. Call the center north and the circumference the south. Then, at any distance between the center and the circumference, a direction at right angles to the thread will be due east and west and a small object as a pencil placed across or square to the thread to represent a ship may be carried completely round the table with this right angled position being altered or the right angled position firmly maintained the vessel must of necessity describe a circle on being moved from right to left or left to right referring again to the diagram figure 19 the vessel may sail from the north towards the south upon the meridian figure one and there turning due west may pass cape horn represented by d and continues its westerly course until it passes the point c or the cape of good hope and again reaches the meridian figure one upon which it may return to the north those then who hold that the earth is a globe because it can be circumnavigated have an argument which is logically incomplete and fallacious. This will be seen at once by putting it in the syllogistic form. The globe only can be circumnavigated. The earth has been circumnavigated. Therefore, the earth is a globe. It has been shown that a plane can be circumnavigated, and therefore, the first or major proposition is false and being so the conclusion is false this portion of the subject furnishes a striking instance of the necessity of at all times proving a proposition by direct and immediate evidence 
instead of quoting a natural phenomenon as proof of what has previ previously been assumed. But a theory will not admit of this method, and therefore the zetetic process or inquiry before conclusion, entirely eschewing assumptions, is the only course which can lead to simple and unalterable truth. Whoever creates or upholds a theory adopts a monster which will sooner or later betray and enslave him or make him ridiculous in the eyes of practical observers. Closely following the subject of circumnavigation, the gain and loss of time discovered on sailing east and west is referred to as another proof of rotundity. But this illustration is equally fallacious with the last and from the same cause, viz., the assumption that a globe only could produce the effect observed. It will be seen by reference to diagram figure 19 that the effect must take place equally upon a plane as upon a globe. Let the ship WE upon the meridian figure 1 at 12 at noon begin to sail towards the position figure 2 which it will reach the next day at 12 or in 24 hours. The same 24 hours will have returned only to figure 1 and will require to move for another hour or more until it reaches the ship at figure 2, making 25 hours instead of 24, in which the sun would have returned to the ship if it had remained at figure 1. In this way, the sun is more and more behind the meridian time of the ship as it proceeds day after day upon its westerly course, so that on completing the circumnavigation, the ship's time is a day later than the solar time, reckoning to and from the meridian at Greenwich. But the contrary follows if the ship sails from figure 1 towards figure 4, or to the east, because it will meet the sun one hour earlier than the 24 hours which would be required for it to pass on to figure 1. Hence, on completing the circle 14321, the time at the ship would be one day in advance of the time at Greenwich, or the position figure 1. Captain Sir J.C. Ross at page 132, volume 2, says, November 25th, is the quote, Having by sailing to the eastward gained 12 hours, it became necessary on crossing the 180th degree and entering upon west longitude in order to have our time correspond with that of England to have two days following the same date and by this means lose time we had gained and still were gaining as we sailed to the eastward." End quote. In further illustration of this matter and to impress the mind of the readers with its importance as an evidence in support of the theory of the Earth's sphericity Several authors have given the following story. Two brothers, twins, born within a few minutes of each other and therefore of the same age, on growing to manhood went to sea. They both circumnavigated the earth, but in opposite directions, and when they again met, one was a day older than the other. Whatever the truth there may be in this account, it is here shown that be no more favorable to the idea of rotundity than it is to the opposite fact that the earth is a plane, as both forms will permit of the same effect. Another phenomenon supposed to prove rotundity is found in the fact that Polaris, or the North Polar Star, gradually sinks into the horizon as the mariner approaches the equator, on passing which it becomes invisible. First, it is an ordinary effect of perspective for an object to appear lower and lower as the observer recedes. Let anyone try the experiment of looking at a lighthouse, church spear, monument, gas lamp, or other elevated object from the distance of a few yards, and notice the angle at which it is observed. On going farther away, the angle will diminish and the object appear lower, and until, if the distance be sufficiently great, the line of sight to the object and the apparently ascending surface of the earth upon which it stands will converge to the angle which constitutes the vanishing point at a single yard beyond which it will be visible. This, then, is the necessary result of the everywhere visible law of perspective 
operating between the eye line and the plane surface upon which the object stands, and has no relation whatever to rotundity. It is not denied that a similar depression of a distant object would take place upon a globe. It is simply contended that it would not occur upon a globe exclusively. But if the Earth is a sphere and the pole star hangs over the northern axis, it would be impossible to see it for a single degree beyond the equator or 90 degrees from the pole. The line of sight would become a tangent to the sphere and consequently several thousand miles out of and divergent from the direction of the pole star. Many cases, however, are on record of the north polar star being visible far beyond the equator, as far even as the Tropic of Capricorn. In the Times newspaper of May 13, 1862, under the head of, quote, Naval and Military Intelligence, end quote, it is stated that Captain Wilkins distinctly saw the Southern Cross and the Polar Star at midnight in 23 hours 53 minutes degrees of latitude and longitude 35 hours 46 minutes. This would be utterly impossible if the Earth were a globe as shown in the figure diagram. Figure 20. Let N represent the North Pole, EE -E the equator, CC, the Tropic of Capricorn, and P, the Polar Star. It will be evident that the line of sight CD, being a tangent to the Earth beyond the equator E, must diverge from the axis N, and could not by any known possibility cause the star P to be visible to an observer at C. No matter how distant the star P, the line CD being divergent from the direction and P could never come in contact with it. The fact then that the polar star has often been seen from many degrees beyond the equator is really an important argument against the doctrine of the Earth's rotundity. It has been thought that because a pendulum vibrates more rapidly in the northern region than at the equator, the Earth is thereby proved to be a globe. And because the variation in the velocity is not exactly as it should be if all the surface of the Earth were equidistant from the center, it has been concluded that the Earth is an oblate spheroid, or that its diameter is rather less through the poles than it is through the equator. The difference it was calculated by Newton to be the 235th part of the whole diameter, or that the polar was to the equatorial diameter as 689 to 692. Huygens have the proportion as 577 to 875, or a difference of about one-third of the whole diameter. Others have given still different proportions, but recently the difference of opinion has become so great that many have concluded that the Earth is really instead of an oblate an oblong spheroid. It is certain that the question, when attempted to be answered by measuring arcs of the meridian, is less satisfactory than was expected. This will be evident from the following quotation from the account of the Ordnance Survey of Great Britain, which was conducted by the Duke of Richmond, Colonel Mudge, General Roy, Mr. Dalby, and others, who measured base lines on Hunslow Health, and Salisbury Plain with glass rods and steel chains. Quote, when these were connected by a chain of triangles and the length computed, the result did not differ more than one inch from the actual measurements, a convincing proof of the accuracy with which all the operations had been conducted. The two stations of Beachy Head in Sussex and Dinoz in the Isle of Wight are invisible from each other, and more than 64 miles asunder, nearly in a direction from east to west, their exact distance was found by the geodetical operations to be 339,397 feet, which equates to 64 miles and 1,477 feet. The azimuth, or bearing of the line between them with respect to the meridian, and also the latitude of Beachy Head, were determined by astronomical observations. From these data, the length of a degree perpendicular to the meridian was computed, 
and thus compared with the length of a meridional degree in the same latitude, gave the proportion of the polar to the equatorial axis. The result thus obtained, however, differed considerably from that obtained by meridional degrees. It has been found impossible to explain the want of agreement in a satisfactory way. By comparing the celestial with the terrestrial arcs, the length of degrees in various parallels was determined, as in the following table. This table presents a singular deviation from the common rule, for instead of the degrees increasing as we proceed from north to south, they appear to decrease as if the earth were an oblong instead of an oblate spheroid. The measurements of small arcs of the meridian in other countries have presented similar instances." End quote. A number of French academicians who measured above three degrees of the meridian in Peru gave as the result of their labors the first degree of the meridian from the equator as 56,653 Toises, whilst another company of academicians who proceeded to Bothnia in Lapland gave the result to, of their calculations as 57,422 toises for the length of a degree cutting the polar circle. But a more recent measurement made by the Swedish astronomers in Bothnia shows the French to have been incorrect. Encyclopedia of Geography by Hugh Murray and several professors in the University of Edinburgh, shows the French to have been incorrect, having given the degree their 196 toises more than the true length. Other observations have been made, but as no two sets of experiments agree in result, it would be very unsatisfactory to conclude from them that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. Returning to the pendulum, it will be found to be equally unsatisfactory as proof of this peculiar rotundity of the Earth. It is argued that as the length of a second's pendulum at the equator is 39,027 inches and 39,197 inches at the North Pole, that the Earth must be a globe having a less diameter through its axis than through its equator. But this proceeds upon the assumption that the Earth is a globe, having a center of attraction of gravitation towards which all bodies gravitate or fall. And, as the pendulum is a falling body under certain restraint, the fact that it oscillates or falls more rapidly at the North than it does at the equator is a proof that the North is nearer to the center of attraction or nearer the center of the Earth than is the equatorial region. And of course, if nearer, the radius must be shorter, and therefore the Earth is a spheroid flattened at the poles. This is very ingenious and very plausible, but unfortunately for its character as an argument, this essential evidence is wanting that the Earth is a globe at all, whether oblate or oblong or truly spherical are questions logically misplaced. It should also be first proved that no other cause can operate besides greater proximity to the center of gravity to produce the variable oscillations of a pendulum. This not being attempted, the whole subject must be condemned as logically insufficient, irregular, and worthless for its intended purpose. Many philosophers have ascribed the alterations in the oscillations of a pendulum to the diminished temperature of the northern center. That the heat gradually and almost uniformly diminishes on passing from the equator to the north is well ascertained. The mean annual temperature of the whole earth at the level of the sea is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. For different latitudes it is under. It is as in this diagram, I believe it is 22. All the solid bodies with which we are surrounded are constantly undergoing changes of bulk corresponding to the variations of temperature. The expansion and contraction of metals by heat and cold form subjects of, there's a source here, million, quote, millions of facts by Sir Richard Phillips, page 475. Serious and careful attention to the chronometer makers, as will appear by the following statements. The length of the pendulum vibrating seconds in vacuo in the latitude of London, which is 
51 degrees, 31 minutes, 8 seconds, at the level of the sea and at the temperature of 62 degrees, has been ascertained with the greatest precision to be 39 degrees, 13929 inches. Now, as the metal of which it is composed is constantly subject to variation of temperature, it cannot but happen that its length is constantly varying. And when it is further stated that if the bob be let down one one hundredth of an inch, the clock will lose ten seconds in twenty four hours. That the elongation of one to one thousandth of an inch will cause it to lose one second per day. And that a change of temperature equal to thirty degrees Fahrenheit will alter its length one to five thousandth part and occasion an error in the rate of going of eight per seconds per day. It will appear evident that some plan must be devised for obviating so serious an inconvenience." End quote. From these data, it is readily seen that the variations in the rate of a pendulum, as it is carried from the equator towards the north, are sufficiently explained without supposing that they arise from a peculiar spheroidal form of the earth. Others have attributed the variable motions of the pendulum to increased density of the air. That quote was from looks like Noad's Lectures on Chemistry, page 41. Others have attributed the variable motions of the pendulum to increased density of the air on going northwards. That the condition of the air must have some influence in this respect will be seen from the following extract from Experiments on Pendulums by Dr. Durham, recorded in Numbers 294 and 480 of the Philosophical Transactions. Quote, the arcs of vibration in vacuo were larger than in the open air, or in the receiver before it was exhausted. The enlargement or diminution of the arches of vibration were constantly proportional to the quantity of air, or rarity or density of it, which was left in the receiver of the air pump. And as the vibrations were larger or shorter, so the times were accordingly viz. two seconds in an hour, with the vibrations were longest, and less and less as the air was readmitted and the vibrations shortened. Thus there are two distinct and tangible causes which necessarily operate to produce the variable oscillations of a pendulum, without supposing any distortion in the supposed rotundity of the earth. First, if the pendulum vibrates in the air which is colder and therefore denser in the north than at the equator, then it must be more or less resisted in its passage through it. And secondly, if it vibrates in vacuo, the temperature being less, the length must be less, the arcs of vibration less, and the velocity greater. In going towards the equator, the temperature increases, the length becomes greater, and the arcs increase, and the times of vibration diminish. Another argument for the globular form of the Earth is the following. The degrees of the longitude radiating from the North Pole gradually increase in extent as they approach the equator, beyond which they gain they again converge towards the south. To this it is then replied that no actual measurement of a degree of longitude has ever been made south of the equator. If it be said that mariners have sailed round the world in the southern region and have computed the length of the degrees, it is again replied that such evidence is unfavorable to the doctrine of rotundity. It will be seen from the following table of what degrees of longitude would be if the Earth were a globe of 25,000 miles in circumference, and comparing these with the results of practical navigation, that the diminution of degrees of longitude beyond the equator is purely imaginary, latitudes at different longitudes. According to the above table, which is copied from a large Mercator's chart in the library of the Mechanics Institute, Royal Hill, Greenwich, the distance round the Earth at the Antarctic Circle would only be about 9,000 miles. But practical navigators give the distances from the Cape Cod of Good Hope to Port Jackson as 8,000 miles, from Port Jackson to Cape Horn as another 8,000 miles, and from Cape Horn to Cape of Good Hope 6,000 miles, making together 22,000 miles. The average longitude of these places is 45 degrees, at which parallel the circuit of the Earth, if it be a globe, it should only be 14,282 miles. 
Here then is an error between the theory of rotundity and practical sailing of 7,718 miles. But there are several statements made by Sir James Clark Ross which tend to make the disparity even greater. At page 236, volume 2 of, quote, South Sea Voyages, it is said, from near Cape Horn to Port Phillip in Melbourne, Australia, the distance is 9,000 miles. These two places are 143 degrees of longitude from each other. Therefore, the whole extent of the Earth's circumference is a mere ar arithmetical question. If 143 degrees make 9,000 miles, what will be the distance made by the whole 360 degrees into which the surface is divided? The answer is 22,657 miles or 8,357 miles more than the theory of rotundity would permit. It must be borne in mind, however, that the Aboye distances are nautical measure, which is reduced to statute miles, gives the actual distance round the south-southern region at a given latitude as 26,433 statute miles, or nearly 1,500 miles more than the largest circumference ever assigned to the Earth at the equator. But actual measurement of a degree of longitude in Australia or some other land far south of the equator can alone place this matter beyond dispute. The problem to be solved might be given as the following. A degree of longitude in England at the latitude of 50 degrees north is 38 degrees 57 minutes nautical or 45 statute miles at the latitude of Port Jackson in Australia which is 45 degrees south, a degree of longitude, if the Earth is a globe, should be 42, 45 minutes nautical, or 49, 52 statute miles. But if the Earth is a plane, and the distances above referred to as given by nautical men are correct, a degree of longitude on the parallel of Port Jackson will be 69 hours 44 statute miles will be 69 44 statute miles being a difference of 1992 or nearly 20 statute miles. In other words, a degree of longitude along the southern part of Australia ought to be, if the earth is a plane, nearly 20 miles greater than a degree of longitude on the southern coast of England. This is the point which has yet to be settled. The day is surely not far distant when the scientific world will demand that the question be decided by proper geodetical operations, and this not altogether for the sake of determining the true figure of the earth, but also for the purpose of ascertaining, if possible, the cause of the many anomalies observed in navigating the southern region. These anomalies have led to the loss of many vessels and the sacrifice of a fearful amount of life and property. Quote, in the southern hemisphere, navigators to India have often fa fancied themselves east of the Cape, when still west, and have been driven ashore on the African coast, which, according to their reckoning, lay behind them. This misfortune happened to a fine frigate, the Challenger, in 1845. Assuredly, there are many shipwrecks from alleged errors in reckoning which may arise from somewhat a false idea of the general form and measurement of the Earth's surface. Such a subject, therefore, ought to be candidly and boldly discussed. These are quotes from Tor Through Creation by the Reverend Thomas Milner and The Builder, September 20th, 1862, in a review of a recently published work on astronomy. It is commonly believed that surveyors when laying out railways and canals are obliged to allow eight inches per mile for the Earth's curvature and that if this were not done in the latter case that the water could not be stationary but would flow on until the end of one mile in each direction. Although the canal should have the same depth throughout the surface would stand eight inches higher in the middle than at the ends. In other words, that the bottom of a canal, in which the allowance of eight inches per mile had not been made, would be a cord to the surface of the contained water, which would be an arc of a circle. To this it is replied 
that both in regard to railways and canals, wherever an allowance has been attempted, the work has not been satisfactory and is so irregular where the results in the earlier days of railway, canal, and other surveying that the most eminent engineers abandoned the practice of the old forward leveling in allowing for convexivity and adopted what is now called the double sight or back and foresight method. It was considered that whether the surface were convex or horizontal, or whether the convexity were more or less than the supposed degree, would be of no consequence in practice if the spirit level or theodolite were employed to read both backwards and forwards for whatever degree of convexivity existed. One, quote, sight would compensate for the other, and if the surface were horizontal, the same mode of leveling would apply. So important did the Ordnance Department of the government consider this matter that it was deemed necessary to make the abandonment of all ideas of rotundity compulsory, and in a standing order, number six, of the House of Lords, as to the preparation of sections for railways, etc., the following language is used, quote, that the section be drawn to the same horizontal scale as the plan and to a vertical scale of not less than one inch to every 100 feet and shall show the surface of the ground marked upon the plan the intended level of the proposed work the height of every embankment and the depth of every cutting and a datum horizontal line which shall be the same throughout the whole length of the work or any branch thereof respectively and shall be referred to some fixed point stated in writing on the section near some portion of such work. And in the case of a canal, cut, navigation, turnpike, or other carriage road or railway near either of the termini, end quote. Number 44 of the standing orders of the House of Commons is similar to the above, number 6 of the House of Lords. Thus it is evident that the doctrine of the Earth's rotundary cannot be mixed up with the practical operations of civil engineers and surveyors, and to prevent the waste of time and the destruction of property which necessarily followed the doings of some who were determined to involve the convexivity of the Earth's surface into their calculations, the very government of the country that has been obliged to interfere. Every surveyor of this and other countries, whether ordnance or otherwise, is now carried out in connection with a horizontal datum, and therefore has no other method proves satisfactory. It is virtually an admission by all the most practical scientific men of the day that Earth cannot be other than a plane. An argument for the Earth's convexivity is thought by many to be found in the following facts. Quote, Fluid or semi-fluid substances in a state of motion invariably assume the globular form as rain, hail, dew, mer mercury, and melted lead, which poured from a great height becomes divided into spherical masses, as in the manufacture of small shot, etc. End quote. Quote, there is an abundant evidence uh, from geology that the earth has been a fluid or semi-fluid mass and it could not, therefore, continue in a state of motion through space without becoming spherical, end quote. Without denying that the Earth has been, at some former period, in a pulpy or semi-fluid state, it is requisite to prove beyond all doubt that it has a motion upon axis and through space, or the conclusion that it is, therefore, spherical, is premature and illogical. It will be shown in a subsequent part of this work that such axial and orbital motion does not exist, and therefore any argument founded upon and including it as a fact is necessarily fallacious. In addition to this, it may be remarked that the tendency in falling fluids to become globular is owing to what has been called attraction of cohesion, not attraction of gravitation. What is very limited in its operation, it is confined to small quantities of matter, if in the manufacture of a small shot, the melted metal is allowed to fall in masses of several ounces or pounds instead of being divided into particles only weighing a few grains, it will never take a spherical form and shot of an inch in diameter could not be made by this process. Bullets of even half an inch diameter can only be made by casting the metal into spherical molds. In tropical countries, the rain, instead of falling in drops or small globules, 
often comes down in large irregular masses which have no approximation whatever to sphericity. So that it is manifestly unjust to affirm of large masses of matter like the earth that which only belongs to minute portions or a few grains in weight. The whole matter taken together entirely fails as an argument for the earth's rotundity. Those who hold that the earth is a globe will often affirm with visible enthusiasm that in an eclipse of the moon there is proof positive of rotundity, that the shadow of the earth upon the moon is always round, and that nothing but a globe could in all positions cast a circular shadow. Here again the essential requirements of an argument are wanting. It is not proved that the moon is eclipsed by a shadow. It is not proved that the earth moves in an orbit and therefore takes different positions. It is not proved that the moon recedes her light from the sun and that therefore her surface is darkened by the earth intercepting the sun's light. It will be shown in the proper place that the earth has no motion in space or on axis, that it is not a shadow which eclipses the moon, that the moon is not a reflector of the sun's light, but is self-luminous and therefore could not possibly obscure, be obscured by a shadow from any object whatsoever. The subject is only introduced here because it forms one of the category of supposed evidence of the Earth's rotundity. But to call that an argument where every necessary proposition is assumed is to stultify both the judgment and the reasoning powers. Many place great reliance upon what is called the spherical excess observed in leveling as a proof of the Earth's rotundity. In Castle's treatise on leveling, it is stated that, quote, the angles taken between any three points on the surface of the Earth by the theodolite are, strictly speaking, spherical angles, and their sum must exceed 180 degrees. And the lines bounding them are not the chords as they should be, but the tangents to the Earth. This excess is inappreciable in common cases but in the larger triangles it becomes necessary to allow for it and to d diminish each of the angles of the observed triangle by one-third of the spherical excess. To calculate this excess, divide the area of the triangle in feet by the radius of the Earth in seconds and the quotient is the excess." End quote. The following observation is made by surveyors, also bears upon the subject. If a spirit level or theodolite be, quote, leveled, and a given point be read upon a graduated staff at the distance of about or more than a hundred chains, this point will have an altitude slightly in excess of the altitude of the crosshair of the theodolite. And if the theodolite be removed to the position of the graduated staff and again leveled and backward sight taken at the distance of one hundred chains, another excess of altitude will be observed, and this excess will go on increasing as often as the experiment or backward and forward observation is repeated. From this it is argued that the line of sight from the spirit level, or theodolite, is a tangent, and that the surface of the earth is therefore spherical. Of a similar character is the following observation. If a theodolite or spirit level be placed upon the seashore and, quote, leveled, end quote, and directed towards the sea, the line of the horizon will be observed to be a given amount below the crosshair of the instrument, to which a certain dip or inclination from the level will have to be given to bring the crosshair and the sea horizon together. It is concluded that as the sea horizon is always observed to be below the crosshair of the leveled theodolite, the line of sight is a tangent, the surface of the water convex, and therefore the Earth is a globe. The conclusion derived from the last three observations is exceedingly plausible and would completely satisfy the minds of scientific men as to the Earth's sphericity if a perfect explanation could not be given. The whole matter has been specially and carefully examined, and one very simple experiment will show that the effects observed do not arise from rotundity in the Earth's surface but from a certain peculiarity in the instruments employed. Take a convex lens or a magnifying glass and hold it over a straight line, drawn across a sheet of paper. If the glass be held so that a part of the straight line can be seen through it and another part seen outside it, 
the difference in the direction of the line will be observed, as shown in the diagram figure, figure 25. Let ABC represent the straight line. If a lens is now held an inch or more according to its focal length over the part of the line AB and the slightest amount of its center, that part of the line AB which passes under the lens will be seen in the direction of the figures 1-2 but if the lens be now moved a little out of its central position in the opposite direction, the line BC will be observed at 3-4, or below BC. A lens is a magnifying glass because it dilates or spreads out from its center the objects observed through it. Therefore, whatever is magnified by it is seen a little out of its axis or center. This is, again, necessitated by the fact that the axis or actual center is always occupied by the crosshair. Thus, the line of sight in the theodolite or spirit level, not being axial or absolutely central, reads upon a graduated staff, a position which is necessarily slightly divergent from the axis of vision. And this is the source of that spherical excess which has so long been considered by surveyors as an important part of the Earth's rotundity. In this instance, as indeed in all others given as evidence that the Earth is a globe, the premises do not fully warrant the conclusion which is premature, drawn before the whole subject is fairly examined, and when other causes are simply sufficient to explain the effects observed. Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, Section Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.